Hey, welcome back everybody. Today we're going to be making another game and making sure that Ed has all the tools he needs to be able to do that. Let's dive right in. Yeah, that's not quite what happened. It started out with me wanting to take a quick break from working on Ed, and I went, you know what? I should learn TypeScript. I built a small snake game in TypeScript and then went back to working on Ed. But things had changed. It was like I was forced back to the Stone Age with unknown types, mystery objects being passed around through functions, and having to constantly cross-reference a bunch of different files just to know what data needed to go where. Oh, everything's crooked! Reality is poison! I, I want to go back! I had to fight myself from converting the entire code base to TypeScript right then and there. So instead, I put it on a do sometime after the first release list and moved on. Then while I was looking at that list, I saw an upgrade to Vue 3 task that I put on there ages ago and thought I'd try giving Vue 3's automatic upgrade tool a shot. Little did Zach know he had just sealed his own fate. Well, it turns out not only did the automatic upgrade tool not work, but apparently in the process I upgraded something involving NPM which completely broke my ability to run Vue 2 version of the project. I did a few hours of troubleshooting, but no matter what I downgraded, I couldn't seem to get NPM to behave itself. So I had a choice to make. I could either continue to troubleshoot the issue, likely for the next couple of days, or I could suck it up, bite the bullet, and manually upgrade the entire code base by hand, which I was going to have to do at some point anyways. While the latter option might sound crazy, Vue 3's new format is actually similar enough to Vue 2's where it wouldn't be that hard to just copy and paste large chunks at a time. I was also itching for that TypeScript upgrade, so if I was going to be modifying almost every line of code anyways, it couldn't hurt to just add a bit of TypeScript syntax along the way. I knew what I had to do. I steeled myself for the journey ahead and called upon the gods of programming to grant me the power to do what needed to be done. I could feel myself becoming one with the spirit of machine code. And the gods of programming answered my prayers with a 103 degree fever that left me bedridden for two weeks. However, this turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as even though I had major brain fog, it doesn't take much brain power to just copy and paste methods, add the word function to the beginning, colon void at the end, and then add different return values if TypeScript complains. Really, it was kind of zen. It also forced me to finally fix the spatial collection class and turn it into something reasonable. It took me over a week of absolutely nothing working to the point where it wasn't even worth running the dev server. But then, it happened. One small formatting tweak later and the editor had officially been converted to Vue 3. Getting the engine converted was essentially the same process but easier, as I didn't even have to copy and paste, I just had to add the TypeScript syntax. The most difficult part was getting the unique build system working in TypeScript, but I managed to do it by using direct imports for development, which gave me proper syntax highlighting, and then automatically replacing those imports with a bundled JavaScript version of the engine when I go to build for deployment. I also moved the shared library into the engine itself, now called Core, since only having one bundle made the build setup a lot easier. Since the old Victor.js library I was using for vectors doesn't support TypeScript, I decided to just quickly write my own instead of hunting down a new one. This also has the benefit of making the build system that much cleaner since I no longer have to bundle any external libraries into the engine itself. Okay, so the whole Vue 3 TypeScript upgrade is finally done, but I just checked some frame times for a small test level I was working on, and they're pretty bad. Since I can't check the Vue 2 version anymore, I'm not sure if these were always this bad, which I don't feel like they were, or if the Vue 3 upgrade slowed things down. Either way, anything above 16 milliseconds is way too much, and things like drawing text boxes slows things down even more. Normally I wouldn't care that much about hitting 60 FPS with these low res 2D games, but considering this is going to be running on a very wide range of hardware, 60 FPS is my target to make sure Ed will run on just about anything. I'm running this on a pretty high-end gaming computer, so if I'm getting below 60 FPS, FPS on this, I don't even need to check to know that the Chromebook I have would be running much worse. That's when I started to hear the voice. Hey, you know what would be a great idea if we rewrote all the renders in WebGL? No, that's a stupid idea. Isn't it? I mean, I have had upgrade to WebGL question mark on my list as something I wanted to look into ever since I started my job as a 3D developer. So while I'm not planning on converting things right now, I at least want to look into it so I can make the conversion as soon as possible after the beta release. Time to write some quick tests. All I'm going to do is write a small web page that simulates what it would be like doing Atlas sprite drawing using both Canvas and WebGL. I'll be honest, I'm not expecting much of a difference. WebGL is fast, but considering how simple drawing 2D sprites is, I'm expecting only about a 7 to 10 millisecond difference, which is pretty good, but I'll still have to be careful in the future not to push things too hard, or that extra headroom is going to disappear really fast. And... 
What? That can't be right, can it? After doing a bit of detective work, I discovered that that number is indeed correct. WebGL is drawing at sub-millisecond speeds. This puts me in a bit of a bind. After the whole Vue 3 TypeScript upgrade, I really don't want to be rewriting all three renderers when the current implementations will at least get me to beta. On the other hand, having sub-millisecond frame times would give me practically unlimited headroom for the future, as well as giving me the opportunity to go back and fix some of the jankiness with the existing renderers. Honestly, I'm pretending like I'm debating this decision, but I know deep down that that tiny voice has already won. Al, can you replace that light bulb in the kitchen? What does it look like I'm doing? So here's how the setup is going to work. First, I'm getting rid of the weird layering system in both editors. Originally, the plan was to draw each layer like the sprites, the grid, and the background all to different buffers and then composite them together in an attempt to not have to re-render everything when, say, only the mouse cursor needs updating. But it ended up where all the buffers were practically updating all at once anyways. The art editor is going to be the simplest one. I can have a single plane act as the canvas, use world space coordinates to draw the background checkerboard, and then use the UV coordinates to draw the sprite and grid. I should be able to do all this in a single draw call. The room editor is a bit more complex, but I can break it down into two components. The first component is the instance renderer, which will render all the objects as instances of a single plane, letting me draw thousands of sprites in a single draw call. There can be two of these in the room renderer, one for the sprites and one for the higher resolution icons. If I include this instance renderer in the engine's core library, it will also let me share the same code between the editor and the engine renderers, which will be a massive improvement over the old renderers, where they were both completely separate despite being almost identical. The second component will be the UI renderer, which will render the grid, the mouse cursor, and anything else that falls into this category. And honestly, I'm really excited to replace the grid code, as the current code achieves the infinite grid effect by wrapping the lines around once they exit the side of the screen. It's super long, super messy, and is a nightmare to make changes to. In comparison, here's the same effect implemented in shader code. Something WebGL relies on though is matrices, which means I need to convert all the viewport navigation code to output matrices instead of the sketchy transformation code I was using before. For some reason when I started this project, I got it into my head that matrices were more complicated than what I needed for a 2D engine and ended up avoiding them entirely. Looking at this view transform code though, it's literally just a matrix multiplication without any of the convenience and readability of using an actual matrix. I thought about using a matrix library for this, but since I'm only using 3x3 matrices, I'm going to just write my own for two reasons. First is that it'll actually be quite simple. The most complex part of a matrix library is dealing with arbitrary dimensions, so knowing we're locked to 3x3 matrices makes everything pretty trivial. And the second reason is that knowing it'll only be 3x3 lets me unroll all the loops and inline most of the code, making things like matrix multiplication about as fast as it could possibly be in JavaScript. Actually implementing it was really straightforward. One of the great things about WebGL is how simple the overall concept is. Upload points, create shaders, create textures, draw. Having such a simple pipeline means that the code is really easy to read, and all the renderers now share an extremely similar structure, making bouncing between them a breeze. The most complicated part was the Atlas render, and that had little to do with WebGL. It was mostly about making sure that each atlas was keeping track of which sprites it had in it and swapping them all out correctly. Currently, each atlas can hold 4,096 unique sprite frames. Since it will instance the same sprite frame multiple times, I doubt the average user will ever get near the maximum amount since they would have to create all of those sprite frames by hand. However, if they do reach that limit, I built in a system to automatically add another atlas and seamlessly switch between them. Then I rewrote the dialogue renderers in WebGL as well, but the overall way they worked didn't really change much. Surprisingly, the dialogue boxes were one of the biggest performance drains when using Canvas, so moving these to WebGL makes a huge performance difference. All that work, and while it's a bit disappointing things look the exact same as before, it's evolved a lot since the beginning. So it's good to be able to go back and rework things, and it's made the code base a lot better to work with. One of the big UX issues was the workflow of having to always create a sprite, then an object, and then place that object in the editor, even if you just wanted a small decoration. My solution to this will be to make every asset type able to be placed directly in the level editor, which should make things a lot more straightforward. This of course is going to create problems with the current property panels, so I'm going to update those to focus less on what type of object is selected, and more on what the current tool is that's selected, allowing more flexibility when performing certain actions. When I was finishing out the maze examples from last time, I really started to hate the clunky way the camera moved, so I added a smart camera option which is much nicer and closer to modern game cameras. Now that the game projects are getting more complex, the way the level editor handles overlapping instances just isn't going to work anymore. Right now you have to keep clicking in a grid cell to cycle through all of the instances in that cell, and it's just not user friendly at all. 
Instead, I decided to take some inspiration from Blender's Alt Click feature and add a small menu that visually displays all instances in that cell when the user double clicks it. Much better. I updated the object editor to use the space a little more efficiently, and then I finally did something about the horrible node category UI. Originally, I was trying to stick to the two-tab panel layout that the other editors use, but I made the decision to use multiple tabs for different categories, and I think it really paid off. Now, each node category can get its own icon and color, which should make the UX a lot more intuitive. As a bonus, these colors and icons can be used on the nodes themselves, making a node tree a lot more readable at a glance. And then for fun, I also added a little back animation when adding instances to the editor. It's a small detail, but I really like it. Now with the editor all prepared, let's dive into the game use case I've been most excited about, Space Invaders. We all know this game. A spaceship at the bottom, aliens at the top, and a ship that shoots lasers which take out the aliens. In order to do this, Ed's going to need quite a few new nodes. Mouse events, collision events, spawn object node, a node that sets the object's constant velocity, a node that gets instance details, a messaging feature similar to events which allow one object to broadcast a message for other objects to react to, timers, ray casting, and whatever other small nodes I realize I'm going to need. As I'm programming these nodes, they're really a piece of cake. I definitely have to thank my past self for designing the node API in a way that surprisingly just works. Timers and messaging nodes became a bit of a problem due to how the async events work, so I have to rewrite that. The main problem is the same node tree is executed for all objects that share the same node tree. So if a node that depends on a specific object's data gets triggered by a timer or a message node after the execution context is changed, it creates a ton of really weird issues. To fix this, I just removed the async event system and updated nodes to rely on keeping their own data internally, as well as taking advantage of the helpful property of the recursive nature of the node node tree, which allows us to easily run code after the rest of the tree is run. Moving on to collisions, things are starting to get interesting. Currently, there are no standard collisions, as the only movement method node currently in ed works by jumping to a point and simply checks to see if that point is occupied before it moves. It worked for our mazed game since we were using tiled movement, but it wouldn't work for anything else that used a smoother style of movement. Everything in ed is a box, so what we need is a way to detect intersection between two boxes. The naive way would be to simply move the object and see if it's colliding with anything each frame. But that wouldn't work for fast moving objects, which would easily teleport through solid walls. So what we actually need is a way to mathematically check along a path and figure out what the intersection point is. Theoretically, we could do this by extruding the object's box along the path and then checking for intersections there. But that's a ton of code which would be very finicky and complex. Alternatively, we can use something called the Minkowski difference. Instead of doing box-on-box -box collision detection, we can expand the collision boxes of all other objects by half of the current object's width and height. Then, instead of having to extrude the box, we just do a line intersection test to each of the boxes. The distance to the closest intersection point is the same as the exact distance we would need to move before colliding with another object. With that, we have basic collision. I can do a bit better, though. As it currently stands, when two objects collide, they just stick to each other, and it feels really clunky. While this would work great for a Space Invaders game, I want the ability for objects to slide against each other when they collide at an angle. In order to do this, I need the surface normal for the side of the box we collide with. Currently, the line box intersection code is just checking each side of the box as its own separate line, so it wouldn't be too hard to just have it return the normal as well. But then I started to hear that little voice again. What if we treated this like an SDF and we solve for both the collision and the edge normal all at once? The idea is really weird, but the math nerd in me started getting really curious about the idea. If I use something similar to an SDF, but using a vector field instead, not only could I do collisions without the need to loop over every single edge, but I could get other information like the normal as well. For those who don't know, an SDF is a function where we input a point and it gives us the distance to the nearest point on a shape. However, if instead I output a vector for each position, the output of the vector field could represent the offset to the nearest collision point. I started playing with the SDF of a box, but after a while I gave up since not only would I have to encode the position, but I'd also have to encode all possible velocities in the XY coordinate output, which just didn't seem possible. Then a little while later I realized, I don't need to encode the velocity. If I provide the velocity along with the dimensions of the box to the vector field function, I'll be able to solve for the specific output based on the current velocity, and can ignore all other possibilities. 
Since SDFs and vector fields are very visual, normally when I make something like those, I know more or less what the output should look like in my head. But I'm having a lot of difficulty picturing this one. Not a problem though, since I already have a collision algorithm, I can just run that for every pixel in an image, and the output should be what the final vector field should look like. So there it is. That's what our goal is going to look like, with the red and green values of each pixel representing the offset to the nearest collision with the given velocity. If we change the velocity, the vector field updates itself to match. Looking at the output, the first thing I notice is that it looks like an SDF of a box, just squished a bit. The question is, how is it being squished? Whenever I'm solving problems like this that involve mystery numbers, my first options are always numbers that I know are relevant, such as the dimensions of the box. And if those don't work, then I might try dividing them in half, multiplying them by two, or by using deductive reasoning to try and suss out the correct formula. At first, I tried scaling the box horizontally by the x component of the velocity and then vertically by the y component of the velocity, but that wasn't working. So the next hint I noticed is that the color changes based on the velocity. It's not just gray, which means the red and green channels are different. So I plugged in the velocity to instead scale the x and y channels separately, and I got something that looked much closer. Now this is the test. To see how close it is, I'm going to bring both the old and the new algorithm outputs into Photoshop and check the difference between the two to see how close I got. And to my surprise, not only are they close, they are absolutely identical, which I wasn't expecting at all. This means that this vector field idea actually has a possibility of working. We still need to mask out the input values that will never collide, so that's going to be done in two steps. First, we mask out the values where the vector's length will never collide. That gets us a little bit closer to our control test. Next, we need to mask out the values which fall into this kind of extruded box shape, which has me kind of stumped, as the whole purpose of these collision functions is to get out of computing an extruded box. I tried playing around with using two boxes which had been offset and doing various difference algorithms and such, and while some got closer than others, none were quite what I needed. Then, I remembered part of this function already has us computing the SDF of a box, and the very purpose of an SDF in most applications is to tell if a point falls inside a shape or not. So by taking the output of our function, which tells us the vector offset, and then adding that to our original point, we can then check to see if that point falls within the SDF of the box. If it does, then it's a valid output. This seems to have solved our last problem, as the two outputs now look identical. After running an automated test, I was even more shocked to see that the results were perfect. Literally every pixel matched up to the original algorithm. And not only that, but it was ludicrously faster than the original algorithm as well. This algorithm also has the benefit that it provides automatic bounce back if an object accidentally overshoots an edge. Using the values we already calculated, it's also trivial to get the normal of the collisions as well. All of that in about 8 steps. Now that I have the surface normal, I can add a slide option to the velocity node, which on collision adjusts the object's direction and then calls itself again to check for a second collision. Since all collision shapes are boxes, it makes this really simple, since any collision not at a right angle will always be redirected to be aligned with an axis, making the next collision always a right angle collision and limiting the maximum possible sequential collisions to two. Was this slide feature necessary for Space Invaders game? Absolutely not. But in this case, I know it's on the to-do list, so it's good to have gotten this out of the way while I'm already working with this code and have it in my head. With collisions and raycasting done, all that's left to do is finish the scripting for Space Invaders. In order to help with debugging, I also added a rudimentary debugging window. It's pretty rough right now, but I have some ideas on how to make it better in the future. And with that, we have Space Invaders! That was a lot. Um, every day, Ed is feeling more and more like a finished piece of software, and we're getting really close to that finish line. So if you want to help support this project and the channel, you can find links to do that down in the links below. And as always, I will see you next time.